Okay. So we're recording this meeting. Everybody, you might get something on your screen where you have to just admit that it's being recorded. Um, we'll send the link to everybody afterwards if you're okay with it. So a big warm welcome to everybody here today. I'm Liesl. I'm the MD from Worldview Academy. And it's been a few months in the making, this wonderful, wonderful certification that we're launching today. Um, we have partnered with Willis Charles Watson to bring you a first of its kind employee engagement and experience certification. And we're very excited to launch this today, to tell you more about it. Um, but we are also going to today share some interesting information about the employee engagement and experience um, research that's been done recently, Willis Taos Watson um, will share some, some very interesting current trends that they're picking up in their research. And of course, a little bit more info information about the certification. So I'm going to introduce to you um, Matthew McDonnell from Willis Taos Watson. Uh, Sam Hi. is here. And then our own Christoph von Staden, um, who's going to be taking you through this presentation. That's going to last uh, round about an hour, a little bit shorter, and then there's going to be time for questions and answers afterwards. So Matt, I'll hand over to you. Thanks, Liesl. Um, and so, yes, a very warm welcome um, from Willis Towers Watson too. Um, so it's myself, Matthew McDonnell and, and Steve Young on, on the line in a sweltering 14 degrees here in London, um, hot by t-shirt st shirt standards for us. Um, so, just a little bit about Willis Towers Watson, very large consulting firm. Um, uh, you've probably heard of us across benefits and, and, and reward. Um, we're one of the biggest providers of employee engagement surveys uh, in the world, probably the largest um, a number of employees working dedicated to the employee engagement field, um, about 400 worldwide. So I've been doing this for about 20 years and Steve, who you'll hear from in a moment, um, leads the whole practice um, of, of those 400 people across the world. Um, so I look after our GB and Samir markets, including Africa, um, and I've worked in this field for 20 years. And my opening remark is that this field, this space we're in has never been hotter than it is right now. Um, and if, if I think down through those, those 20 years I've worked in this field, the conversation has often been, well, how do we get senior stakeholder buy-in? How do we get HR at the table? How do we establish the business case? That conversation's really moved on um, and employee engagement and experience is top of all leaders' minds. Um, it's been accelerated by the pandemic, like many other um, themes such as well-being and inclusion. Um, but it really is, it goes without saying that, that leaders got to get this right and it's the responsibility of all leaders to, to focus on this. So I just wanted to share that um, experience that I've had uh, over the last year in dealing with, with clients. Um, and, and here's the agenda. This is what we'd like to talk about. Um, Liesl's hi highlighted that. It's around the employee experience and engagement and the research behind that and the research behind our model, um, one of the most validated models um, in the world across this space. Uh, but then we thought you might want to hear about well, what does that mean in Africa and what kind of data cuts have you got uh, to give us some uh, context around Africa. And then thinking about, which everyone is thinking about now, uh, returning after uh, the pandemic uh, after the lockdown, um, what does it mean for the future work and hybrid working arrangements? And then we're going to talk about the certification program itself um, and have a discussion for those who want to stay on beyond the hour. Um, so that's the agenda. The housekeeping, um, Liesl's mentioned that we're recording this session, so hopefully you're still with us. That hasn't put you off, um, but it's just to circulate this um, afterwards for people who weren't able to make it. Uh, please type into any questions you have in the chat. Um, so we're going to be moderating the chat as we go. So do feel free to, to post those questions and we will address them. Either if we can answer it quickly on the fly, we will, or, or we'll leave it to the end. And of course, the, the, the mantra of the last 18 months, keep yourselves on mute if you're not speaking, um, uh, goes without saying. And just before we dive into the detail itself, we wanted to launch a quick polling question just to understand where you're at in terms of the employee experience. Um, and to, so the question, but well, this is a question, hopefully it will be able to pop it, pop it up on a poll. 
um, which you'll be able to complete. Here we go. So please vote away. We're really interested to hear your views. Go. Coming in quickly, 26, 29, 30. Three. that the web user has. So that's someone came off. Well, it looks like we're settling here um, around fifty percent. We talk about a lot, but we have no strategic approach. But it's great that a quarter of you already have, or the organisations you work in, um, believe it's important and have a defined EX strategy. Um, so that's great. I think, are we able to end the polling now? Can I just click on that? So hopefully I can. And then... uh, there we go. So that's, that's the final data's in. Yep, so 26%, very important. 50%, we talk about it, but we have no strategic approach. 18%, it's on our radar, and a very honest 5%, what is employee experience? Thanks very much. So Steve, I'm gonna hand over to you to, to work with that and tell us about the latest research on, on EX. Thanks, Matt. Um, welcome, everybody. Um, yeah, I guess my job is to convert the 5% of you who don't know what EX is into a zero. Um, so thank you for joining. I thought what I would do is just to set some context for you all um, and share some research and some thinking from Willis Towers Watson on employee experience, what it is, its, its value, its role, um, and uh, how it relates to business performance and, and therefore what you can do in your organizations and others to understand it and to listen and, and you know make changes. So um, Matt, yeah, thanks. If you can go to the next slide. I guess the, the general context is that, you know, we are increasingly all living in an experienced economy. Um, people have written about this. Uh, you can find um, a lot of writing in this space, largely initially driven by consumers in some ways. Um, consumers have moved to, you know, from just wanting commodities through to goods and services now into experiences are increasingly uh, what we talk about, whether that's um, you know, broad experiences, online experiences, uh, and, and that's certainly moved into the employee world. Uh, many, many uh, organizations that we work with increasingly are talking about um, what's the employee experience uh, in relation to what we're doing and, and believe that that's important. And, um, it, you know, just to underscore that, if you move on to the next slide, Matt, we did some research recently. We um, surveyed I think about 1500 different organizations asked them a, a range of questions on employee experience, what they're doing, what they think about it. Um, but one of the most kind of startling findings was this. Prior to the pandemic, uh, only about half of the people we surveyed, so these are large, you know, big global organizations, about half said that EX was a priority, employee experience was a priority in the next three years. Uh, Post-pandemic, 92% of those organizations said that uh, enhancing employee experience will be a priority. So that's a huge shift. Um, and so it was, a, it was clearly on the agenda, um, uh, but now it's really become you know, top of the list. Uh, I think everyone's understood that trying to uh, appreciate and look after employees and their working experience is really uh, one of the the, the most critical aspects of running organizations. And so the focus on what that is and how to do it has become you know, really, really um, very prominent. Within that research, what we see on the, the next slide, we try to uncover where is everybody on the kind of maturity curve of employee experience, a little bit like the poll that you just saw. And um, we asked a number of questions, we asked people, whether they had an EX strategy, whether they were using technology to improve the employee experience, whether the strategy was aligned to the business strategy. Um, and it was really interesting. We found that there's, there's really a, a curve in terms of maturity. 
there are about a quarter of organizations globally, uh, certainly from the ones we surveyed, who have no EX strategy, no understanding of what they want to do in that space, and they're not using any technology. Um, there's about a third, 35%, who have a basic understanding of employee experience. And this is maybe where some of you were in, in those responses. So they have some definition of what they want to do uh, in terms of improving the employee experience, but it's not aligned to the business strategy. It's maybe in HR, but it's not, uh, it's not a critical component of the business strategy. And they might use some technology, but they haven't really got that organized. Then there's another 30% who are a bit more advanced. They have an EX strategy and it is aligned to the business strategy. So there's, a, there's more synergy there, but still they're not really using technology uh, to drive it. And then you've got the kind of top end of the curve at one in 10 who have an EX strategy. It is integrated and aligned with the business strategy and they are using technologies in different ways to help them transform the employee experience. So we call these the kind of the most mature, these are the transformative EX organizations. So you can see anyway, there's a spread. Um, it's, it's new territory for many, um, but there's definitely a shift from uh, left through to right. So, um, a basic premise of employee experience. Um, employee experience can mean many things. Um, we define it really of the, as the sum of all the moments that matter in, um, in your working experience and your day-to-day -day working uh, life. And so that's very, very broad. And, and we'll get to what that is and the components in a minute. But the basic premise is that employee experience is important because those experiences you have at work with your organization, um, they predict uh, future outcomes. So they predict engagement, they predict performance, they predict well-being. They fundamentally, ultimately predict the results of your organization. Now that's, that's a premise, it's a belief. Um, as we'll see in a second, it's also been supported by a lot of evidence. So it's something that um, is, is more of a, not just a nice to have, but actually a business imperative. And so we argue that understanding the employee experience is really a critical role for the organization and for HR um, and for the two to come together. Because if you get the employee experience wrong, then that will have impact, negative impact on engagement, performance, well-being, and the results of the organization. Um, and so as we go through on the next slide, we just, you know, we're making the point that you can actually understand employee experience, you can define it, you can measure it, uh, and you can understand where your organization sits on a spectrum from, from good to bad, and we can score it and, and so on. Um, and, uh, you know, on the next slide, what we'll see is we've based this uh, premise on a lot of research. And you can see on the right hand side, a whole number of business outcomes that we have linked through uh, different kinds of analytics, uh, predictive analytics to uh, employee experience. So EX is a predictor of engagement, well-being, employee turnover, productivity, customer satisfaction, sales, revenue, uh, return on equity and assets and growth and, and margin. Uh, all of these business metrics are things which can be predicted by um, the strength of your uh, fundamental employee experience. And if we look on the next slide, this is some research that we did a couple of years ago now, just as an example. We took 120 global organizations across sectors, medium, large size organizations, and we measured them through employee surveys um, across a range of uh, aspects of employee experience. And we boiled that survey data down to one score, an EX index, if you will, a summary of the employee experience. And then we mapped that score to their financial performance over the next year to three years uh, on a number of measures. And you can see them here. So return on assets, equity, uh, one year changes in margin, three year changes in margin and growth. Um, and there was a very, very clear link. We grouped the companies into three groups. Uh, the first group had a low score on this index. Uh, the middle group had an average score and the, the third group had a high score. So very simple design. And what you can see very simply is there's a very strong um, correlation, at least a predictive link between um, EX, their score and all of uh, these measures. And what's 
interesting on this slide is this is the uh, average performance beyond their sector average. It's not just increase or change, it's how you, whether you outperform your sector or whether you underperform your sector. And so essentially what this is saying is, if you can understand the employee experience, you can predict whether an organization will be beating its sector or underperforming its sector on financial metrics. So very, very powerful uh, indicator. So in, in, in some ways you could argue employee experience is a, is a predictor of the you know, fundamental strength or the health of your organization. So, uh, and we have much other research as well, but fundamentally um, making a powerful case that the two are linked and one is uh, predictive of the other. So um, what is employee experience and what are the pieces that matter? Th this index I mentioned um, is uh, a number of questions in an employee survey that we send out to employees. It's, it's got 34 questions. We could do a pulse version, which has 12 questions and, and we can benchmark it. But um, what it is comprised of is a number of critical um, elements. And you can see those elements are, are arranged into the three rows here. And you can see there are four different columns, four different content areas. And if we move to the next slide, I'll, I'll unpack those a little bit. Uh, we derive those 12 components by looking at research into uh, companies who have good financial performance across our whole um, em employee uh, client, uh, uh, you know, range of clients. So we, every year, we work with about 500 clients or so, uh, all doing different kinds of employee surveys. So we have a lot of good data from the employee side and the performance side. And when we compare what we call high performing companies, those are companies who are financially successful over the long term, uh, at least three year performance of good financials. When we compare those to our average clients who maybe you know, don't have that kind of financial performance, and we look at the survey scores and the difference between survey scores, we see um, some significant gaps in some areas, um, and smaller gaps in, in some other areas. So this table here shows rank ordered. The topics which are at the top are the most differentiating of our high performing companies versus the average. So you can see very clearly, um, there are four topics where survey scores are, are very different um, compared to the average. So that, first of all, is that sense of inspiration. Are you inspired by uh, the vision and the mission of this organization. Uh, 13 percentage points higher in those financially successful companies versus the global average. Secondly, um, is a kind of joint second, a three topics, um, which again are big differentiators. Do we feel there's a sense of drive in this organization? In other words, are we innovative? Are we focused on the market? Are we agile? Are we customer focused? Uh, do we have competitive products or services? Uh, that general sense of drive um, is 10 points above the average. Do we have a strong sense of and culture of trust? Do we trust leaders? Do leaders trust us? Um, and also, do I individually have a sense that I can grow here? I can achieve my potential. Um, so what you see is scores on all of those topic areas significantly higher in the financially successful versus average organizations. Um, and we call this group of issues uh, the, the excellence level. Um, this is all about the kind of mindset that's needed to succeed. Uh, these are the things that most differentiate high performers. Then if we go down to the next level in, in blue, there are some issues where um, there are differences between high performers and the rest, but they're not quite so strong, but they're nevertheless significant. So do I have a sense of voice? Uh, do I feel a sense of inclusion in this organization? Uh, are my capabilities and skills being developed? Do we collaborate well? These are areas where there is more emphasis uh, in high performers than in ordinary organizations. So it's, it's still harder to do, um, but it's possible. And this is the, these are the issues where uh, you begin to pull away. And these are all about personal agency. Um, do I, you know, do I have a voice? Am I included? It's all about myself. Uh, am I active and, and, and uh, having a meaningful role in the organization. And then there's some topics where there's a little bit of difference, but not a huge amount. We call these the essentials. Um, do I feel supported by a, my, my manager and my supervisor and my team? Are we well organized? Do I understand what's going on in my role? 
Um, do I feel a sense of security from my, my pay and my benefits? So those things differentiate a little bit, but they're not the key differentiators. Uh, we call them the essentials. So this is validated across 500 organizations and um, is the underpinnings of that model that you just saw. Uh, now, if you look on the next slide, what's really interesting is when you take those um, uh, different factors of the employee experience, we find broadly across many of our organizations that we work with that those topics towards the top, towards the excellence level, they tend to be predictors of sales, revenue, uh, customer satisfaction. Those things towards the bottom tend to be predictors of efficiency, productivity, quality, safety. Uh, so there's a, there's a bit of a distinction going on here between things that kind of drive um, value in the organization, more kind of top line predictors at, uh, in that excellence level. And as you get more to the essentials level, it's more about uh, preserving value, minimizing risk, um, uh, and, um, you know, um, maybe more kind of bottom line crudely uh, factors. So you see that the employee experience operates in different ways, but you also see that, you know, to drive an organization in a, into a growth mode, you need to be pushing on those top factors, inspiration, drive, trust, and growth. Often very intangible things, the things towards the bottom, which are all about kind of, you know, pay programs and benefit programs and how we're organized Mark, and the, and the infrastructure. They're really important. You don't want to get them wrong, but alone, they're not going to be driving um, growth in an organization, but they will work on bottom line and minimizing risks. So you see how different aspects of the experience are important for different kinds of outcomes. And what we'll look at now is the model uh, and then which things uh, specifically drive different outcomes. Um, we pull those factors together into this overall uh, view. So you can see again, the three levels, uh, the essentials, the emphasis and the excellence level. Um, but we organize it in four columns and you can see that on the left, uh, all of those relate to issues of purpose in the organization. Then the next column is all to do with work. Uh, then to do with reward or total rewards, and then the people on the right-hand side. So the idea is that really, from a basic psychology perspective, if we, if we think about what do we want from work, why do people work? Um, well, we argue there's four fundamental dimensions, these columns here. So we want to work for you know a great organization that's doing great things that, that we're inspired and motivated by. That's the purpose. Uh, we want to do work in an organization that's thriving and doing great work that we like, and it's our craft, and it's something that we really, you know, find interesting. Um, that's the work column. We want then to get something in return, so we want to be able to grow and be rewarded, um, and, uh, you know, that kind of, uh, you know, give and get model. Um, uh, that's the reward column or total rewards. And then, you know, just like in, in life in general, um, we want to work with great people, great leaders. We want to, you know, enjoy our work, we want to feel trusted, that we can collaborate and we're supported. So there's these four fundamental dimensions that we use to organize um, those levels. And this gives us our, our view of what is an employee experience uh, or a modern view of employee experience. And then if we just look at the next few slides, what we did was we, we looked across hundreds of um, analytics studies where we've done predictive analytics with many, many clients to see what drives different outcomes in each of our client organizations. And what we find is um, uh, when we look at the you know, rank order, the, the frequency with, with which each of these are drivers or predictors of performance outcomes in our clients, uh, you can see, as I kind of mentioned before, things towards the top in the excellence level tend to drive uh, a predict sales revenue um, and customer satisfaction. Number one is that sense of drive. So are we focused on the market? Are we, you know, do we have market leading products and services? Are we agile, innovative? Number two is that sense of inspiration. Number three is a sense of growth. Number four is that culture of trust. And number five is that sense of, uh, do I have a voice and a say in what we do? Those tend to be, uh, from our research across hundreds of organizations, the most frequent predictors of business outcomes at the kind of top line level. Uh, on the next slide, we find that when you look at what drives people um, uh, metrics, typically in the HR space, so absenteeism and employee turnover, it's spread. 
So you find actually number one is how organized are we? Are we efficient? Um, uh, number two is up at the top inspiration. So am I inspired? If so, I'll tend to stay. Um, uh, number three, do I have a sense of growth? If so, I'll tend to stay. Um, now we see then down at the bottom that sense of security from pay and benefits um, kicks in in terms of whether I stay with the organization. And also again, do I have a sense of voice is important to me uh, to, uh, to not be absent or to stay with the organization. And then the next slide, we look at the um, drivers of kind of more, you know, bottom line uh, risk related factors in some ways. Number one, again, is are we organized? So if we're organized, if we're efficient, if we're continually improving uh, that kind of, um, you know, kind of excellence model, then um, we're more likely to be efficient and productive from a, a performance point of view. Do I feel supported by my team? Again, am I inspired? Do I feel a sense of trust? And do we have good pay and benefits? Those things are the things that tend to be driving uh, efficiency, productivity. And as I mentioned before, I think we see on the next slide, you can look at that model of employee experience and really argue that the things towards the top, the excellence level are more top line value drivers or value creators. Uh, the things towards the bottom generally are more, more kind of bottom line risk reducers, if you will. Uh, they're all about preserving value uh, and minimizing risk. So that's an overview really of how we see employee experience. It's, it's like the, the culture, if you will, the broader um, experience, which drives things like engagement uh, and other outcomes uh, within the organization. Now, um, what we see on the next slide, we make the point that employee experience isn't static. It's, it's always changing, of course. That's what we all experience at work, all right? And, um, and therefore to understand it properly we need to be listening and adapting our approaches uh, on a more continuous basis and so um, what we certainly are finding in our industry Matt and myself and colleagues is that as clients want to understand their employee experience and, and put in place a listening strategy uh, increasingly those listening strategies are more continuous than just point in time. But the, again, there's a maturity and there's um, a, a range of activities people are doing which you know start in a more traditional space and as they mature move towards this more continuous listening. So this diagram here is just trying to summarize really what we see in the market. Um, and so top right what you can see is you know the, the traditional way of looking at uh, understanding employee experiences by running an annual survey. Um, often you know engagement surveys where engagement is an outcome but you're also asking lots of questions which cover off the broad employee experience and then you can find from that experience which are the drivers or predictors of engagement or other things if you link it to business data so they're really you know large organizational wide efforts um, and the idea is that you're using it to drive change through the organization and through teams uh, and, and managers and that's the traditional model and still you know, the vast majority of organizations do an annual or maybe a biannual survey of some kind, large census, all employees. Um, increasingly popular, and we've been doing this certainly for the last few years, is to add to that annual survey, the ability to do agile listening. So running pulse surveys, uh, either you know, quarterly on a kind of a scheduled basis or in an agile fashion where you just, you know, a topic comes up and you can suddenly uh, deploy uh, a survey very quickly, uh, self-service through software uh, or supported by, you know, people like ourselves. And, um, you know, we saw that a lot through COVID, of course, um, many, many clients wanting to understand the impact, how people were feeling, um, what they could do about it through very rapidly deployed surveys. And increasingly, you know, that's that's the you know more common model because big topics of interest around the world, well-being, um, diversity, equity, inclusion, ESG, these kind of topics, people want to be able to listen quickly in the moment, um, but with some depth on particular topics rather than the broad all um, employee survey. So those are very, very popular devices. Increasingly, as we move around, um, many, many clients also want to get some qualitative depth, some color uh, and richness to the story behind the data. So using uh, focus groups or increasingly virtual focus groups, so, you know, AI driven technology where you're 
uh, people are typing in, like in a in a chat app, um, their responses and, and the analytics is is uh, yeah, analyzing that text in real time and summarizing the issues and the themes uh, so that you can um, you know get the insights immediately rather than you know old school focus groups where you're taking notes and writing it up and it takes a while. So that's a, a technique which is very uh, popular now, increasingly popular, especially in in this world where you need to listen quickly and rapidly. And then for more sophisticated users, and this is emerging now as, as something of a, a trend, uh, certainly in some of our more mature markets, uh, clients are interested in listening in the moment. So as something happens, as somebody completes an onboarding process or they choose to exit or it's their annual um, review process has happened or they've just returned from maternity leave, let's say, then um, because Workday or Success Factors or Oracle or whatever knows that uh, it, it, it has a flag, then that triggers a survey, it gets sent to the employee, asks them about it, and then you're getting feedback, you know, very much in the moment and you can track trends and so on. Uh, so that's increasingly uh, emerging as a, as a new form of listening. I don't think that overcomes the annual survey or the pulse surveys, but it's an addition to. And then, um, Increasingly, clients are looking at the analytics behind this. So taking that employee listening data, mapping it to uh, business outcomes, as we've seen, uh, and being able to make predictions about uh, business, in, uh, business impact. And then finally, something which is, um, has, a, has a, a complementary place, I think, within this whole um, strategy is being able to listen in real time, maybe use some kind of EMPS measure. Uh, so you've got a, an almost live temperature check um, which you can then use to flag issues as they arise, uh, as things spike, um, uh, and you can see then, you know, you can dig deep to find out what the issue is. Uh, so some clients beginning to use that, um, although maybe not quite so popular as some of the other techniques. So there I shall pause. Hopefully that's given you a good sense of how we understand employee experience, uh, its importance, and how we can uh, measure it through different survey and analytic techniques. Thanks very much, Steve. Um, Lisa, I don't know whether there's any burning questions that have come up on the chat, um, or I will keep moving on. Matt, and there's two, there's, sorry, there's, there's two questions. I don't know if you want to take them now or later. Can I read them? Yep, sure. Uh, Anton Kloppers is asking, how does engagement differ between South Africa and, for instance, the US, UK, rest of the world, and can it be attributed to labor laws and unions? And I know you're going to get to some, yep. some trends. Yep. Second question, um, I'm struggling, it's from Mon, I'm struggling to get EX on our corporate agenda. How do I get HR and operations to acknowledge it and include EX in our business strategy? Mm -hmm. I, yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, not a simple answer. Shall I tackle that, Matt, or have a yes, go? Yes, Steve, please do. I mean, I think in, in some ways it's some of the things we've just been saying. Um, certainly what we have found is, first of all, that making the link between EX and the business metrics is really powerful. So one of those financial slides I showed earlier with the, the bars and the three different groups, if you remember, um, we found that well partly from a sales perspective but partly from a use within our clients as a kind of killer slide to take to a ceo or a cfo uh to say look there is a link there's a business link between the employee experience and our business outcomes it, it's predictive it predicts our performance it predicts whether we'll beat our competitors or not um and so making that business case we found is is really super helpful um the so you know uh, that, that's how I would argue, you know, you should kind of try and get it on the agenda, take the business case and then build out what do we mean by it afterwards. Um, secondly, we find that uh, uh, once clients can understand it, they need a process to, um, uh, to kind of drive it and, and build it. And one thing that works very well, we haven't got time to go into it in detail here, but is to think about what's your business strategy What's your purpose? And therefore, what would our aspirational employee experience be? What's our North Star? Um, uh, for those of us in the Northern Hemisphere. Um, 
you know, what's the, what are you aiming for as an employee experience, which supports the purpose of the organization and therefore supports the business strategy. And that's a process you need to go through and define it. There's not one size fits all. Um, but we've found with many clients is when you can go through that process, decide what your priorities are that relate to your purpose and your strategy, then uh, and, and use a broad range of stakeholders to, to create that and work that, then you'll tend to get a lot more buy and then you've got something to aim for, you've got something to talk about, and you can use these kind of survey techniques and so on to see uh, you know, how you're progressing and, and what progress you're making. So that's a, a very short answer to what is, yeah, a fairly complex problem perhaps, but hopefully that's helpful. Brilliant, thanks Steve. Um, and, and the second one around the South Africa context, I'll, I'll cover in a moment. Um, I just want to underline here that, you know, the model that Steve has shared underpins the certification uh, program. So that is the model that we use to understand. That's the model knowledge we'll, we'll talk to you about. Um, and these are the tools we'll talk to you about uh, during the, that five day program. Um, and you'll get to use some of these tools as well to see how you could deploy these in your organization. So you can use them real time um, on people. Uh, we wanna make this, this course as um, uh, helpful as and impactful as possible. So you get to touch and feel the tools. Wonderful, I'm gonna keep moving on. Um, so this was the, well, the question was, you know, you know, is this, how does this model vary by region? We, we knew this would probably be on your mind. Um, and one of the benefits of having a very large database of clients is we can build benchmarks. So the idea is that organizations work with us and then we collect their data and we build composite benchmarks and they are incredibly useful for understanding employee engagement and the employee experience. Without them, it is really hard to know what means what. Um, so a score of 60% favorable actually might be pretty good and a score of 85% might be really poor. It depends what the question is and, and the benchmark. So we're able to look at those benchmarks and uh, create some pictures of, of, of these regional differences. So here I'm looking at the South Africa region. Um, it is predominantly South Africa. There's about 100 organizations from South Africa in there, but it is also including um, other countries, uh, neighboring com uh, countries. And just how this works, that so um, the, the scale here, that the dark green, which there aren't any on this particular slide, is actually your apps, your companies in South Africa would be at the high performance levels or above it. The light green, uh, which you do have three of here are around where you're approaching the high performance level. So pretty close, uh, maybe not past it at, at the thematic level, but there'll be questions. You're certainly above the high performance level. Um, and the orange is, is some of the gaps to, to reach that. And the red is where your co companies in South Africa are significantly behind. So we wouldn't expect you to be above the high performance norm because the high performance norm is a stretch norm. It's a challenge norm. Uh, it's a global norm of the best cultures um, and the best organizations to work for. So what's really interesting about this picture in South Africa is, is this um, a very strong sentiment and feeling about what you do, how, why you do it, how you do it, the way you're organized and, and the, the belief in the products and services you provide. Uh, so it's a customer external mindset, which is, which is really strong and is at those high performance levels for organizations in South Africa, which is a great uh, starting uh, point. Where it seems to, where companies seem to struggle in South Africa around some of the people dimensions, particularly around relationship with leadership. Um, I think it's either high expectations um, or, 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 or something around leadership skills, we're not sure, but, but people have less confidence in leaders, considerably less than, than they do in, in other countries. So something around trust, um, there's something around having a voice in the organization, so empowering all people. Um, now, whether that's reality or not, or whether it's people's expectations of what their voice should be, we don't know, but it's something that they're, they're less happy about. Um, and finally, th this third column here, it's around what Steve mentioned, the give and the get or the, the employee value proposition. 
and what do I get in return for my efforts? This is the psychological contract. Am I paid fairly? Are my benefits, uh, um, am I rewarded, um, you know, satisfactorily for what I bring? And are you developing me to be my best self? Um, these are some of the, the challenge areas in the South Africa region. Uh, and one of the key takeaways for this slide is if you're working for an organization in South Africa and you want to look different and attract people and retain people, you need to look at some of these red areas. And this is where you're going to get your most um, mileage in terms of creating a better a more attractive employee experience within your company. It's what you're saying about how you're growing people. Um, it's what you're saying about how you reward them, how you empower them and how you build that leadership. Um, trust and confidence in leaders. And, and just to highlight some of these gaps, um, I, I realise I need to keep moving actually in terms of our, our time here, but some really strong scores in South Africa, belief in products and services, understanding the goals and what I do and how it connects to the overall purpose of the organisation, the quality, the customer feedback, these are significantly above high performance norm. Um, so th these are really your levers um, 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 to, to drive success um, and they're already at that high performance level. But when you look at the lowest scoring questions for companies in South Africa versus this stretch benchmark, do you see some pretty large gaps? So um, only 42% are confident that the organization makes decisions promptly. Uh, only 46% think they do a good job of managing change um, or communicating down the line. Again, well below that high performance level, minus 23. And also the rewards so of the deal, it's actually particularly around benefits. The benefits offered only 60% of people think they, they meet my needs. Um, and we've seen a, a huge uh, demand on benefits, particularly around the pandemic, around um, well-being and, and looking after employees. Um, so, so there's some of the challenges within South Africa, whether that's related to labor laws I don't know. I mean, I, I, there's certainly something historic we've seen in the data in South Africa. Um, engagement levels tend to be a, um, a little bit lower than average, we would see, uh, as an outcome of all this. Um, but sure, I think there's high expectations and I think there's an ambivalent relationship with leaders in South Africa, um, which, which is underpinning these scores. And, and you can only see this um, when you compare to the benchmarks um, to see how your organisation is faring. I hope that answered the question the best I could. Um, and, and a couple of other views. So East Africa region, it, it behaves quite differently. Again, it's a very large norm. Uh, a lot of uh, companies within Kenya here, but also um, the surrounding and neighboring countries. Very strong on this top row that Steve was talking about, the one that really drives growth and revenue. Um, couple of areas not quite as strong, having a voice and being fair paid. Uh, fairly paid for what I do it is not as strong in East Africa. A bit of a kind of a fear of speaking up we see in East Africa uh, comes through quite strongly, but the rest is very um, high scores. And then um, Western Central Africa, and again, this will be dominated by uh, Nigeria and Ghana, um, but you can see pretty good across the board. It's a very high scoring, you know, benchmarks in Nigeria are very high. Um, so you can see they've got a lot that are close to that high performance level. It's around reward, but they're, they're not quite as at the high performance level. And these things across the middle, the kind of the personal agency, um, you know, being included, having a voice, developing um, my skills, um, which is also leading to lower scores on growth. And again, scores on trust. But, but you can see overall the picture much more positive in Western, Central and Africa. And so they're very useful context to, to think about when, when you're defining your employee experience um, in the countries you, you work within and how do you actually um, ensure that you're creating values and a culture and an employee experience that is going to differentiate you um, from the competitors. Okay, um, I'm going to go through this very quickly. I hope you're okay with that, but I know this is on top of your minds, it's on top of everyone's minds that we're talking to. What is the future of EX in the hybrid world? Um, actually, we could, are we able to launch a quick poll, um, Liesl? Um, this was something we wanted to hear from you. Um, how many of you have this well-defined hybrid working uh, plan for, for returning to work? Right. 
wait and see approach. This was the one that I was thinking would probably be quite high. Wonderful. I think we're probably going to, yeah, it's going to hover around there. So I might just end the polling now, um, keep moving. Um, but yeah, so the, we're adopting the wait and see approach. And I know in, in South Africa, in particular at the moment, um, you're still in lockdown. So this wait and see approach is um, more likely to be the, to the favoured one. It's something we're seeing clients really struggling with. No one has quite got this right or got a really clear view. Everyone's sort of working it um, uh, out as they go. Um, so you're in uh, familiar, you're in company with, with, with many other organizations. What does the research tell us? So we did some research um, on organizations where people were working from home and people working in the office, but we did it pre-pandemic. Um, in other words, it's a, almost a truer picture of the experience about, you know, the experience of working from home versus uh, working in office before we all had to work from home, um, which has skewed the data somewhat. But in a nutshell, the experience for people working from home who had elected to work from home um, before the pandemic were much more positive. They report a, report a better EX. Um, and in particular, they, they're much more positive on how they're rewarded, um, feeling that the deal they're getting is better. And that doesn't surprise us because working from home is seen as a real um, um, an advantage um, and enables you to, to uh, balance your life in, in uh, a much uh, more advantageous way. We don't see great advantages around collaboration, growth and having a voice. So this suggests that these will be some of the areas that are going to be more challenging. We see working from home executives particularly happy. Um, they really enjoy the advantages of being to work from home, but um, they, they do, they're much less favorable around collaboration. So they don't see as much collaboration happening in the organization and they don't collaborate with their colleagues um, uh, as uh, they don't um, yeah, collaborate with their, their team members as much. We also see mid tenure people particularly happy three to 10 years. But interestingly, it's the tenure and over bracket. We see less happy with the working from home. Maybe they're, they're, it's a, a, an older generation more used to going into the office, but they don't seem to enjoy working from home as much as the, the mid tenure bands. And working from home, people are more likely to stay with you. So there's a lot of advantages in the working from home model. Um, and now just sharing the same models that uh, Stephen's been talking about. This is working from home versus a company location you can see that they're, they're, they're much more positive. Um, for example, on security pay, they're plus 7% higher uh, on average uh, for the questions around um, security. So it seems like there's an advantage to it, but we do see there are some challenges. They're not as positive around the, these, um, the, these areas in the bottom here, being co collaborative, having an input, having a voice and uh, um, is one challenge areas. So one of the challenges we, we just highlighted that's coming through the data, collaboration, growth, having a voice and supports, we think this will continue in the reopening uh, and in the hybrid um, working world. And, and what are some of the opportunities? So really just focusing your mind here on the new, opportun new opportunities. Um, it, it's really about identifying what is the work that needs to happen in a collaborative way and scheduling, being smart about scheduling time where people can work in a collaborative way on innovative uh, ideas or, or projects in person on site. Um, and then thinking about knowledge work, which doesn't need to happen um, uh, to, in a collaborative way um, where those days could be allowed, people will be allowed to work from home. Uh, a couple of other principles we're finding useful is if the meeting is partially at home and partially um, people dialing in the best thing is to get everyone to dial into the meeting um, just to, to keep, keep an equal footing for, for all people. Um, growth opportunities this is one we're definitely keeping an eye on we think that there's going to be a proximity bias um, the data does suggest this that you will go to people around you can see for those quick assignments stretch assignments um, it, it's just logical they're in your kind of your frame of reference so 
looking at resources to keep people um, informed of all opportunities and tracking opportunities, make sure you're giving everyone a fair chance. Um, and this is a real manager skill here, making sure everyone's voice is heard. Um, the managers have got to be, um, have the right sort of in, in, uh, emotional intelligence for this and making sure that all uh, participants get their voice, even if it is having a bit of an alarm bell uh, that you set for every meeting where I need to go around the room and make sure I've heard every voice in this, in this call. Um, and scheduling the most significant meetings to when everyone um, is in the office. And of course, you need a continuous investment in the technology, um, uh, the, the collaboration platforms, making sure everyone is able to, to work effectively from home. And also thinking about, again, when do we schedule meetings where um, it's not going to be perhaps where people are picking up kids or, or, or looking after somebody um, or, or, or other responsibilities. So a lot to be thinking about. We think the manager is going to place, uh, is going to have a really important role in, in managing this, this return to work. It's not easy. Um, there's going to be a lot of moving parts. And maybe the managers and leaders of the past, uh, those skills may not be as important going forward, where you're going to have to have people who are much more um, uh, in tune with, with, with their people and, and how to be flexible. Uh, an interesting bit of research we found that during the pandemic, introverted leaders have excelled where extroverted leaders have um, struggled because they need the buzz and the energy of people in the office to thrive, whereas introverts can sort of have one-to-ones and do that contact time, and they've actually had much more impact. So in ways, it's, it's leveled that out, but some of those skills that introverts have, how do you make sure all managers have those um, uh, in, in the future world of work? So that was a rattle through that um, um, but we want to spend some time talking about the certification program. I'm going to hand over to Christo um, in a moment. Um, so here, what, this is what we're going to talk about. Um, we're going to help you using that model um, and all those tools help you be able to design a listening program that works within the organization that you're part of or that you're going to be working with um, so that you could run an engagement survey that you could roll out a listening program. Um, and just because we haven't talked about engagement as much, it is not, um, it's not less relevant. It's a, it's a really important KPI, but we treat it as an outcome. So if you can deliver a great employee experience, you're more likely to have highly engaged people using our model of engaged, enabled, energized. It's, it's a state of mind measure, which we include in every survey, um, but it is the end result of, of a great employee experience that you offer. I'm going to hand over to Christo to talk us through the benefits and, and the course in more detail. Good stuff. Thank you, Matt. And thank you, Stephen. That's been very interesting so far. Uh, okay, so I, I guess at this point, the big question is that uh, I think the item that came highest in the first poll, which is uh, uh, it's on a, it's important, we think it's important, what are we going to do about it? And uh, this is where the certification comes in. It's, it's really about what are we going to do about it? How are we going to make it in, work in the organization? Um, so the, the, the bottom line here is, um, is to create the capability inside the organization to make employee engagement and experience as a strategic initiative work to build a performance culture, uh, to build it around the purpose of the organization, um, to properly design it with, uh, with, the, with the right um, engagement of all stakeholders across the organization. And this is the same time to understand that uh, the implementation of any kind of initiative of this order has huge organizational impact and implications. Uh, and and that's the big question: is how do you how do you make this thing uh, become the way things are in this organization? How do you make it the culture of the organization? Matt, can you shift to the next uh, slide? Go through. So so there are specific outcomes that we are looking to achieve through the certification program. The first is back to Mon's question at the beginning. Uh, how do you actually get this under the attention of the executives and how do you get the executives to see this as really important? 
So the per first, first outcome of the certification, the first piece of work that we will be doing will be about making the case for employee experience uh, as a strategic priority in your specific context. This is where we uh, now just move. I mean, we've got uh, basic theory around this. We understand the link between talent, uh, employee experience, performance, um, but how does it work in your organization? What's your organization's specific uh, issues that you are trying to resolve um, through strategy? The second point there is to position employee experience uh, as organization-wide and, and the intervention or the in initiative to establish an employee experience as a holistic initiative. It's not something that's uh, I think one of the challenges we experience in organizational transformation is that we have these piecemeal interventions. There's a little initiative to do that, and there's a little initiative to do that. But of course, when we do something like employee experience in the organization, it's fundamental. It uh, potentially transforms just about every aspect of the organization. And it's to, uh, to develop a deep understanding of this and to also go back to your organization to clearly see uh, what, what are the implications. What goes with that is the adoption of employee experience as people or brand strategy. Uh, it's uh, deeply uh, implicated in how you attract and retain uh, the people that you want in the organization. Then a coherent uh, approach approach to the adoption and implementation of employee experience. Um, uh, in this, I mean, what's our experience uh, model? What's our model for employee experience? Uh, how do we understand the employee experience in the organization? There are a few approaches. And the important thing here is to, is to, is to make a choice uh, and, and to properly uh, employ that approach. Um, involving key stakeholders, that's now when we start to do the work of actually making the employee experience, uh, you know, establishing the employee experience in the organization, is who are involved, who has a stake, and how are we engaged with them? And what goes with that is the next point around change leadership. How do we uh, stimulate and encourage and support change leadership? Um, then we go into the specific details of, uh, of, of, okay, so we have decided that employee experience is strategically important. We've got uh, uh, the engagement of the leaders who are intimately involved and who are critical to the success of this initiative. What is this employee experience going to look like? What do we want to focus on? What do we want to uh, support, uh, uh, drive? I, I don't like the word drive, but drive. Um, so using the framework, how do we go about shaping the, what we actually want in the organization? Then developing the infrastructure for the employee experience initiative. It's, uh, it's, it's really, uh, you know, what kind of technology are we going to use? What kind of systems are we going to use? Uh, what roles and responsibilities are there in the organization to make the employee experience happen? Uh, then a very technical piece, a very important piece about actually doing the survey research, the, the, the listening process. Uh, making sense of what we get back from the listening process. And then finally, this critical piece, uh, which is around, okay, so how are we actually going to do something about it? What are we going to do? How are we going to shift the leadership, for instance? How are we going to establish a more team-based culture? Uh, how are we going to, uh, to develop the organization so that the organization becomes an embodiment of the employee experience? Good. Matt, next one. Thank you. And that is... And that is what the certificate will look like. 
So at the end of this, uh, we will certify you as someone who is able to, to establish and implement and be involved in the establishment and implementation of the employee engagement and experience of the organization. Thanks, Matt. Sure. So we, we have been thinking that there are three basic uh, audiences for this certification. The first is obviously uh, human resources leaders and professionals for whom this has become uh, really critical capability, uh, something that is absolutely necessary inside the organization. With them as well, the second category of talent and OD specialists. And then finally, uh, well, perhaps not finally, there may be other categories as well, but people leaders, people who are in the organization, who are delivering, uh, shaping, um, walking the talk of the employee experience every single day in the organization and who are really the crucible of the employee experience uh, it's for them as well and then I would love to take you through the outline of the program itself so the program is structured in um, five modules. They all built up towards the last module, module five, which is the moment of presentation assessment. And uh, throughout the modules, you will be working along doing field work in your organization. It's for us, it's incredibly important that you work with inside your own organization so that it's absolutely practical. It's not a theoretical exercise. So you will be developing a plan and a high level implementation plan in the format of the presentation, present this in module five, uh, get feedback from, from, from uh, other people on the program as well as the program leaders. So how do we get there? Uh, modules one and two, we, we consider concepts of employee experience and uh, engagement. The first one will be about making the case for employee experience, as I already mentioned. Uh, we look at issue-centric employee experience so that it's always, uh, we're not just creating the employee experience because it's a nice thing to do, we're doing it to resolve specific organizational strategy issues. Uh, then understanding the business context in which the employee experience is developed inside the organization. And then finally, in that module, the implications of adopting employee engagement and experience as a strategic initiative. It's got an impact on all matter of things inside the organization. The strategy itself is affected by the uh, adoption, uh, the organization design, how the organization is structured and set up is affected by that. And of course, uh, the culture of the organization, specifically the way that we develop leaders in the organization is affected by that. The second module is the work of employee experience. And uh, here we, we look at really what are the critical capabilities around implementing the employee experience, developing the employee experience in the organization. So first of all, is you, your own profile and uh, what it is that you need as an employee experience practitioner, uh, competencies, capabilities, et cetera. Then we will look at employee experience principles, the framework and the models uh, to understand how we actually approach this, this initiative in the organization. Uh, we will explore the question of organizational stakeholders and all the communities that are involved in the development of and the development and the establishment of the employee experience. And then finally, in that module, we will look at uh, change leadership around the initiative. The module three and four uh, are um, employee experience practices where we get really practical. Uh, so um, module three will be about how do you design your, uh, your organization's employee experience. We will look at the employee experience methodology and then specifically at, uh, at how we understand the um, 
how we do research and how we make sense of the research. What's the kinds of metrics that we are that we are looking at? Uh, what are the what are the factors of employee experience that we want to that we want to emphasize given the organization strategy context, etc. And then module four will be around the employee experience project or initiative itself. So practical experience, practical work in with the instruments to conduct the, uh, the listening work, uh, practical experience then also around uh, making sense of the data that we receive back, and then uh, developing our thinking and capabilities around how do we intervene to make the transformation that is required. This program, uh, it, it will run over five days and each, each module is one, one week apart. And which gives a little bit of time between each model to do some of the practical field work that is required. So, so that you don't get to the end of four weeks and then have to do the whole thing. Uh, also, um, you know, after module one, you will do some field work and it will feed back into module two and we will work further with this. So once again, it's, a, it's an incredibly practical program. Our focus is very practical. You have to be able to go out and do the work uh, and you, do the work not only after module five, but start doing the work after module one. Yeah, and that's it. And then as you can see the price, uh, 28,500 rand per delegate. Um, I don't know, Matt, Liesel, you wanna say anything about that perhaps? Um. <laughs> Yeah, the, uh, we've we've had a look at at other certifications um, and and courses available, and we feel that it's it's quite a reasonable price if you look at um, at certain other certifications and accreditations over a five day period, and especially the practicality of this course. Like you say, Chris, too, you'll be able when you leave, you'll be able to do the work. It's not just a bunch of theory that we're going to teach you. We're going to make it as practical as possible. Yeah. I want to add to that that um, you know we, we we run the first intake starting on 17 August. Uh, uh, we run as a public program. It's also quite possible if you want to build significant capability inside your organisation that we can uh, offer this program in house, in which it becomes even more practical and focused. Yeah, and I would add, um, Christian Liesel, you know, there's nothing else. On the market like this, which is, offers a fully immersive <clears throat> um, program, which is, is spaced so that you can do ask those questions of the organisation and do that homework. So it really is <clears throat> quite unique course. Um, and, and as going back to my remarks at the beginning, this topic is so hot and it's not going to go away. And so wherever you are, whether you're an HR professional or you become a leader, whatever you do. You're going to need to know how to harness employee input um, and the employee voice to um, improve and build your organizational culture. So it's it's a very relevant um, <clears throat> certification. It's going to help you. And as some of those data slides that Steve showed, um, you'll be able to run a program like this um, after the course. You'll be enabled to do that. And the return for the company is huge um, and it's been demonstrated time and time not just by us but by many other academic bodies and, and, and other vendors in the space so it's in that regard it seems to seem a, a small uh, price to pay for, for a lot of value mm. yeah. um we've got a question um i'm just checking can can we move to questions now yes yeah okay yes. so everyone um I'm going to watch the the chat, um, but you can also, if you want to just ask your question, put up your hand um, and we'll we'll look for you. Um, if you if you want to to register after this course, everybody has my email address because the um, the invitation came from that, but you might have received your invitation from somebody else. Otherwise, info at wolfsviewacademy.com is an address that will answer all your questions. Um, so the question we have here 
is um, there's a clear link between employee experience and company culture, but often leaders view company culture as a separate topic to the overall HR or people strategy. How do I get executives to see that the two are inherently linked and all forms part of the HR or people agenda? Mm. Yeah. I mean, that's that's one of the things that struck me uh, in, in the work on this so far is that is that you actually cannot talk about employee engagement and employee experience and not talk about culture. Those things are, are, are absolutely intimately linked. Uh, in a certain respect, culture is experience. We experience culture. It, it is, of course, culture is all the things that we do and all the ways in which we do things and all the organizational artifacts that we create. But but fundamentally, it is the organizational world, it, it's the quality of the organizational world that we come to experience. So, so, so from that point, there is actually absolutely no distinction to be made between the two. I find the distinction between them very hard. So <laughs> how do you get the executives to see this? Uh, I, guess, I guess that's part of that module one. Uh, is how do you get executives to see that? Um, I don't know. Uh, Matt, if you have any ideas, it's sometimes so difficult to explain something that seems to be so obvious. Yeah, and, and sometimes it's just terms and, and, and words that are in favour and not in favour. And I think down the years, culture has felt a little bit sort of abstract. Um, but, but what we're seeing now is culture is a word that's being used a lot. And, and so we sometimes use it interchangeably, employee experience or the culture. Um, so I think that's part of it because it's the same thing, as you say, Christo, it's the shared behaviors. It's how things get done um, in this organization and, and, and the shared values and norms around behavior. So absolutely, you're right. If you think about it, well, how could it not be on their radar? Um, we do have some research as well, which is quite interesting, which is saying that if you're pursuing a strategy, for example, of safety, there are particular cultural attributes that drive that uh, business objective much higher than others. So it might be around training or line manager relationships. And so there is quite a lot of data we can share and we'll share as part of this course to show this culture supports that objective. So again, it's just, building the bridge between um, what feels something a little bit abstract to something that's pretty concrete and um, uh, yeah, business, business focused. Um, Matt, just to build on that, um, you know, I think both of you are right, Christo and Matt, you know, that they're kind of interchangeable. The experience that we talked about is really how, how you experience the culture. Um, and we've shown that that's important, that relates to business outcomes. And then the leadership piece is leadership sets the tone. It sets the, the fundamental mindset or the values or, or you know, the assumptions when we get into culture definitions, but they set the tone for that culture. And so, <laughs> nice cat. Um, as you know, I think the challenge for leadership is to say, you are setting the tone. The ultimate, the experience which comes from that relates to the performance and predicts the performance of this organization. Therefore, it's a, it's an, it's a leadership imperative to get this right. Uh, we need to define what good looks like for us. We can look at research that helps us, but we need to define what good looks like for us. And that's an imperative. That's a people imperative. Um, you know, we argue very strongly that employee experience is really a guiding framework for organizations you know it should be a, a construct that leaders understand they need to get right um, and what we see in some of the more progressive organizations is leaders get it you know I, I have a client where the CEO now she will walk around with this model and, and scores and scorecards on this model you know literally in her her back pocket because she that's her shorthand for for where they need to improve and, and, and how they define a strategy around their culture or employee experience. It depends on terminology. Some, some organizations don't like the word culture. Um, some leaders don't get it. Then use the word employee experience or vice versa. Um, we can get into the theory of that, but I think ultimately leaders set the tone. They set the, the mindset which drives how people experience 
working life and therefore ultimately how we perform. And I think that's the argument to make. So part of the process in my mind is getting the right stakeholders bought in and, and stakeholder mapping and thinking about the process to convince people and make the business case. And then it makes your life a lot easier. Thanks Steve, but a great question. Anything else, Liesl, that's come up on the chat? Um, there, there was a question about the entry requirements, which I've answered in the chat. Um, so basically, it's just um, that we, we believe that the level of, of the certification would be relevant for people who's got some work experience in the field, um, rather than people directly out of school. Um, but because it's not tied to a specific NQF level, um, that there's, there's no formal requirements as such. Uh, there was a question from Anton, would this program be successful in local, provincial, national, government type organizations? Big challenge, he says. Yeah, indeed, big challenge. Uh, <clears throat> but I, but, uh, and I think almost what lies behind, behind Anton, your question is, uh, will it work for large bureaucracies? Um, where, and I, and I, and I think all our large bureaucracies are facing huge challenges of transformation. Um, I'm currently working in a provincial government in a transformation process. And I cannot think that it would not work. There's of course a, a, a whole lot of it depends in there. The, it is an experience to work in government, is an experience. To work, in a, to work in a municipality is a kind of experience, perhaps not a great experience <clears throat> in all of them. Um, and I think there are some provincial and even national government departments where, where you would say the experience is not so bad, but wherever there is an experience, an employee experience, and that is everywhere, and wherever there is a willingness to to put it on the strategic agenda and to make it a strategic priority, um, we can work to make that experience better and to alter that experience. So, so, so that's almost the first point is if there's a willingness, it can be done. Uh, and if we bring in the right listening uh, processes and we bring in the right approach to intervention and we manage to all the way through at least get some level of commitment involvement from senior leadership. You know, I think something like senior leadership commitment from a strategic perspective, it's incredibly important, but at some other level, uh, <clears throat> Senior leadership is generally quite disconnected from the experience of the rest of the organization. That experience is really in the hands of first line managers, middle managers, et cetera. And uh, there's always a possibility to, 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 to start transforming and shifting uh, a system, even a deeply bureaucratic system towards a system where a different kind of experience is possible. I don't think you can take a big bureaucracy and overnight turn it into a most agile organization. Um, uh, it's just not gonna happen, it's, but you can start making shifts in the right direction and possibly at some point reach a tipping point. There are examples across the world of incredibly agile government uh, departments and governments. Um, so, 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 so I would say no sector is excluded and no historical formation of government, for instance, a large bureaucracy is excluded from this kind of work. I think it's the sort of work that we have to do, the sort of transformation that we have to do in every single type of organization in our world. Great answer, Christo. Um, I couldn't agree with you more. <clears throat> um, and as you say, every company has an employee experience, whether they like it, or whether they state it or not, it's there. Um, 
and it's whether to what extent you want to take hold of it and control it and and try to drive a journey towards um, a better employee experience um, so we would strongly suggest every every group of individuals in an organization um, should strive to, to make it a, a better employee experience and it could be when you look at the 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 grid that we showed you that maybe the agility one you're not going to make such a big um, improvement on but why couldn't you improve the way leaders connect with people I and mean, how they talk to people how they respect people and listen to people why could you not give everyone some more say in what they do or empower them even in, in micro ways we know that it really makes a difference to people having some control over what they do um, so I think it's a, an aspirational journey for every organization totally agree and we see shifts of, of employee experience in every sector and every organization so we have another two or three questions um Tinas is asking application and use of knowledge gained post certification in my workplace will one be limited to use the platform and license to access willis styles watson systems platforms and then there was a if yes cost involved we can take this offline but i think the the question is around um the platform uh post the certification sure yeah so as part of the um qualification as part of the certification program you you would get to use the software and it, it's it, you know even if you go on to use something else it's 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 fine you, you'll be understanding about how do you design a good question how do you use benchmarks um what types of thing when should you ask them how long should a survey be so all that stuff is baked into the experience of using our software um, and then you get to use that on a team or a department you can pilot it and see how it works and how people react um, then it's entirely up to you with you then choose to go on and, and engage with with us and uh, get a license to the platform, which um, the advantage would be having done the course, you could literally just open um, the software and it is a software fee um, and, and run your own survey, but that would be a separate um, uh, moment where you, you would need to buy that access to that software. Thanks, Matt. Uh, one more question. How does technology improve the employee experience, especially in an environment where majority of employees are healthcare workers with minimum to no access to computers? With mobile cell phones, employees may not have smartphones or data. That's a great, great question. I don't know whether uh, Steve or Christo want to answer, but I mean, I'll, I'll, I can kick <laughs> it off. Um, you, you, certainly what we're seeing, I mean, the world is moving in that direction um, and we're seeing more and more organisations, even in the health sector, providing devices, providing ways to use technology um, in, in ways they haven't before. Um, the mobile phones are becoming pretty ubiquitous. Uh, I appreciate they're not everywhere, um, but, but that's certainly the, the trend we're seeing. If, if that's not the case, we, we find ways to ask people in whatever setting they are we're working with a organization now of, of um uh, leaf uh, sorry a tea plantation so all the workers out in the fields we're getting ipads out to all those people they're giving us their say and we're playing back the results to, to those uh teams so there's ways to engage people wherever to reach them um, no one's out of the reach of technology is my, my view mm. i i think this 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 um Bhavani, uh, there's almost two parts of that question. The one is how do we do the listening process through technology, which is um, which is one powerful way of doing it. Um, but of course, there are other ways. Uh, I'm always thinking of employee engagement. You know, the bottom line of employee engagement is engage with your employees. Uh, <laughs> if you want engaged employees, you have to engage with them. And it means that you have to go out and you have to, I don't know, say hello, how are you, what is it that you want, what makes you happy, what makes you unhappy, etc. And then I, you know, technology and the actual employee experience, I don't think we must conflate those two. Um, I personally am certainly very wary of conflating the two. I think technology can be a support for a greater, better employee experience. But at the heart of the employee experience, if you look at all those things that, uh, that, that Steve and Matt showed, 
uh, it is things, uh, you know, there's 12 qualities. Those 12 qualities, to a large extent, has to do with how you and I connect with each other inside the organization on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, things like trust and uh, how do I actually pay attention to your growth, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So I don't think an employee experience itself is dependent on technology. Uh, in fact, I think we have to have a very good look at technology and uh, in many organizations actually figure out how technology is becoming between us and mm -hmm. a good experience. Yeah, I totally agree. Um, you know, fundamentally, it's about the psychology, you know, how, how you think and feel that impacts these things. Technology can enable that in some cases, for sure. But ultimately, you know, how you feel about your leader, how you feel about the people you work with, how you feel about what it is you're doing, how you feel about the purpose of the organization. These things can be helped through technology and communications, maybe, but fundamentally, they're, they're about the psychology of going to work, you know, and a colleague of mine was saying, in some ways, it's no different to when you're at school in the playground, you know, you want to be with people that you really enjoy and get on with, you want to connect with them, as you said, you want to be doing cool stuff, you want to be enjoying it, um, you know, you want to uh, get something back um, by, you know, growing and developing and doing well in your exams or whatever, um, you know, these are some fundamental people uh, dimensions that uh, that are the big ones, and technology is a part. Yeah, sure, but it's not it's not the only thing. And I think sometimes we conflate. We hear about employee experience, platforms and systems that that they touch a bit of it for sure, but they don't touch the majority of it. So I think um, you know there's no reason why you can't improve the employee experience for people who have no technology at all, um, because it's it's a it's a kind of it's the psychological dimensions. I think. Mm -hmm. uh, that really drive some of those things, how you feel, how you think, how you behave. Which is a nice note to end off on. <laughs> We've reached 11.30 and I see the messages coming in. Uh, lots of thanks. It was incredibly informative. Great. Loved it. Very interesting, etc. So thank you, everybody. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for staying on. Thank you for asking questions. Um, Matt and Steve, thank you so much. It was a, a great, um, a great talk. Um, lots of very interesting information. Um, and thank you, Chris, too. Any any last last words from anybody while we say goodbye? I just hope to see many of you on the program. I'm looking forward to it. It's a fascinating piece of work. This. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Great. Well, thank you, everybody. Thanks, everyone. Thank Bye. You. Bye.